Welcome back, everybody. The breaking news just minutes ago, the Wagner Group is standing down in its march towards Moscow. With me now, Masha Gessen, a staff writer for The New Yorker. Um, they're also the author of Surviving Autocrat and, and wrote a biography on Vladimir Putin um, as well. Surviving Autocracy, excuse me. Uh, Masha, thanks for joining us on this. Um, appreciate it. Give me your reaction, first and foremost, to the latest developments that we're hearing um, right now. Prigozhin, it seems, standing down um, after a negotiation with um, Belarusian President Lukashenko. Well, we don't know what it means, uh, as, as the previous speakers have said. Uh, and I think there are two entirely contradictory forces now acting on Putin. On the one hand, uh, there's some sort of deal, right? So that means he has to give Prigozhin some of what Prigozhin wants, which is probably more autonomy, more backup, uh, less dependence uh, or on the Ministry of Defense, which is who he's been struggling with for the last couple of weeks. Um, and on the other hand, Putin has to prevent this from happening again. So he needs to crack down on the people who have supported Prigozhin, on Prigozhin himself, and on people who have encountered Prigozhin's forces in places that they have made it to in the last 24 hours. For example, Rostov on the Don, a large city in southern Russia, the, the, the seat of the southern military command in Russia, where as they were packing up to leave, according to TV Rain, which is reporting from there, people are actually applauding them and saying thank you. So how Putin is going to balance these two completely contradictory exigencies, right? On the one hand, give Prigozhin enough to have him stand down. On the other hand, crack down on Prigozhin and his supporters and his potential supporters to prevent this from happening again is anybody's guess. So we're actually going to, to I think, see a slowed down version of this crisis for some time to come. Okay, so what position does this put the Russian president in right now? Uh, a very, very difficult position. This is the most vulnerable he's probably ever been, right? His monopoly on force has been challenged. His monopoly on the information space has been challenged. Uh, so what he needs to do is reestablish those two monopolies. That's, that requires a crackdown of unprecedented proportions, and we don't actually know if he has the ability to carry out that crackdown. My guess is he probably does, but I can't be certain. How does he continue this war in Ukraine when Prigozhin publicly called out uh, the Russian president and the claims that he made as to why they initially invaded Ukraine? How does he even maintain his popularity domestically or support for the war in Ukraine? If he had it at all, of course, we're relying on unreliable information coming out of Russia right now? Um, that, I think, is actually less of a problem than it might seem, because we're not, we're not talking about a pluralistic country. We're not talking about a country in which people have sort of a choice of positions to take, right? Um, uh, that the sort of the specter of that choice just appeared in the last 24 hours with Prigozhin's statements. But totalitarian propaganda acts by making people believe that nothing is knowable, everything is fluid, everything is dynamic. So that actually can be sort of subsumed into that flow of propaganda, especially if Putin cracks down on information, which may be happening. There are reports that Telegram, which is the main channel uh, that both the opposition and uh, I mean, the ma main channel of communication, the main medium that both the opposition and the Kremlin are using. Uh, uh, Telegram is notoriously difficult to shut off. Basically, it would require shutting off the entire Russian inter internet from the rest of the world. It's not an impossible proposition, so that could happen. But there are reports that, uh, that Telegram is having uh, uh, connection problems. Um, is this showing that there is a crack in the ceiling? when it comes to Vladimir Putin's leadership, right? If you're thinking about Navalny, for instance, does he see this as a possibility of a way in that they've never seen before in the last two plus decades of Putin's regime? Yes, this is as close to a crack as we have seen in the 23 years that Putin has been in power in Russia. Uh, at the same time, uh, Navalny is prison. He is facing up to 30 years uh, in, in prison under the, current, the new charges that have been brought against him. 
And uh, Prigozhin is no fan of Navalny's. It's not like if Prigozhin were to seize power in Russia, if that's right. even his that uh, that he would release Navalny from jail. What did you expect when you saw this all unfolding? Prigozhin's objective was. Um, I don't think Prigozhin never articulated the objective of seizing power in Russia. Prigozhin wants what he wants, which is uh, sort of unbridled military power. Uh, and Prigozhin is frustrated. Like, I mean, this is this is a tantrum thrown by a mercenary leader. We don't need to <laughs> see that he has major strategic object strategic objectives. But the effect of what he's done is a challenge to Putin's monopoly on power. Astounding. Masha Gessen, as always, um, it is great to talk to you. Um, thank you for joining us this hour.